Carlos, don't lick the microphone. Oh, God. <laughs> Kieran Culkin licking the cheese. Ew. You know, speaking of succession, this discussion of the debt ceiling reminds me of when Frank tells Kendall that he has to offer a stupid number for Walter. And he's like, what's a stupid number? He's like, I don't know, a bedillion? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that's what that's what I think we're talking about bedillions when it comes to uh, to the national debt. I personally account all of my wealth in terms of bedillions, don't you? <laughs> Fractions of bedillions. <laughs> Fractions of bedillions. <laughs> From New York Times Opinion, I'm Michelle Cottle. I'm Ross Dowsett. I'm Carlos Lozada. And I'm Lydia Polgreen. And this is Matter of Opinion. All right. Well, friends, either the drama is over or it is about to get really real. Over the weekend, House Speaker McCarthy and President Biden agreed on a deal to lift the debt ceiling for two years. This would mean that we as a country can actually pay our creditors and the global financial system can stay afloat. But we're recording before Congress actually votes on the deal, so it could all still fall apart. Because, well, no one really seems happy with the specifics. Republicans have spent months demanding government cuts in exchange for agreeing to suspend the debt ceiling. And what McCarthy and Biden agreed to does amount to a small reduction, but nothing close to what House conservatives had hoped for. On the other hand, many Democrats are ticked that Biden negotiated it all. Raising the debt ceiling is necessary to pay back money that Congress has already spent. Today, we're going to talk about that spending. Does America have a spending problem? Do we really need to rein it in? And how can we avoid ending up in another debt ceiling fight down the road? Have any of you gone to look at the national debt clock online where you can see just the figures rising like, I don't know, like 30 grand every second or two? It's like fake numbers. It's just the mind reels trying to calculate it. Well, it, it really kind of sobers the mind to watch it. You know, the debt is now, what, 31 trillion plus. And if that number makes no sense, it's about $94,000 per person in the United States, not per taxpayer, not per like working adult, per person. And so people often say like, oh, we've been through these debt ceiling fights before. True, but it keeps getting bigger. The big 2011 debt fight with like, you know, Boehner and Obama and the Tea Party crew in, in Congress, you know, the debt there was about half what it is now. So it's, it's something that sort of keeps not getting fixed. And we can say, I think correctly, that these debt ceiling fights are ridiculous, that, you know, the government's debating whether to borrow the money that it's already agreed to spend. But the national debt numbers keep getting kind of ridiculous. And it's hard to say when else we can have a real conversation over the federal budget than in these debt ceiling moments. I mean, the reality is that we have a long history of making deals much like the one it appears they're going to make around the debt ceiling. There's a multi-decade tradition of the debt ceiling being an opportunity for the two parties to sort of horse trade a bit to give each other cover for taking what is a sort of unpleasant vote. And you can go back and find footage of Barack Obama voting against raising the debt ceiling under George W. Bush. And so the, the in certain ways, the core question in terms of the responsibility of this negotiating tactic is just how close are you getting to an actual default? If you're just, if you sort of know going in that you're going to do some horse trading, cut a little bit of spending, then the level of irresponsibility is not that high. If you go in where, assuming that default is a live, real option, then the level of irresponsibility is a lot higher. And I think we're sort of somewhere in between. But I think a lot of liberals who are angry at the Biden administration for negotiating at all, for not sort of, you know, trying to force this issue and prove that we do not negotiate over the debt ceiling, you know, their view is this is just setting us up for a crazier scenario down the road. 
But they did get a two-year raise, right? So it's not, the, the crazy scenario is not going to happen until January 2025. Um, I, far I, yeah, in the I mean, future. I we'll, we'll, far, all be, far, far. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll all be living in the singularity by then. We'll have a horrific, you know, presidential cycle under our belts, although, you know, we can't say for certain that it'll be decided by January 2025. Let's be, Jared, let's be Jared clear. Jared Mencken's appeals will <laughs> still be working their way through the courts. I want to I want to come back to Carlos's question about the growth of the national debt. I mean, I guess like is that really a problem? Are we ever really going to pay it back? You know, is money actually real? Does that debt really <laughs> matter? Um, you know, because money is actually fake, right? I mean, like it's kind of a made-up concept that, you know, you can always just print more and uh I, I'm skeptical about the idea that this national debt, this $94,000 that every sort of man, woman, child, and gender nonconforming, non-binary person owes to the federal government, is actually like a real thing that we should care about. I'm just totally unpersuaded. I mean, if we look at a world in which Miami is going to be underwater in a matter of a few dozen years, and, you know, the scale of problems that we're facing as a civilization, I just... I guess I just don't really care about that $94,000. Um, can, can someone convince me that I should? Yes. Yes, I will make my best effort to convince you that you should, precisely because of the scale of the problems we're going to face in the future. Um, I just I just want to say that we are not a credentialist uh, podcast here at Matter of Opinion, but it is worth noting that Carlos Lozada is a trained economist, so he, <laughs> he carries some special authority in this, uh, in this That category. was in a different life. <laughs> um, I spent two years working for the Federal Reserve in the 90s. There's my um, my claim to credentialism. And Once an economist, always an economist. Uh, yes. All right. So it's getting to the point where just interest payments on the debt are becoming a huge chunk of the U.S. government's annual spending. And what does that mean? That means that you are crowding out other important spending, whether on infrastructure that you might need when Florida goes under. Research and development to deal with the crises such as climate change that you are worried about more so than the debt, right? Education. When when you're paying so much of your, your annual budget to interest payment on the debt, it gives you a lot less flexibility in case a real crisis or external shock happens where you'd normally want to ramp up borrowing and spending. Like the way this normally could work is that in in moments of economic contraction, you increase spending and you run deficits to help boost the economy. In moments of high economic growth and potentially greater tax receipts, you could pare back on spending and maybe even run a surplus, right? We don't do that. We keep running deficits even when the economy is in good shape. And so I think that's the, you know, it's less taking it out of the kind of notional, you know, how real is this anyway? And thinking like, okay, what are the consequences to our annual budgeting, you know, to how we spend our money when we have this level of debt. And that's the one I'm, I'm most concerned about is just the extent to which interest payments on the debt keep growing as a portion of our annual federal budget. But this is not really about controlling the debt. It's about cutting government spending. I mean, the Trump administration didn't really seem to care how much it boosted the deficit with its tax cuts, and Republican lawmakers were happy to vote for those. I mean, you'll notice there are, are no rollbacks of the Trump tax cuts in the deal that they have just cut. So this is not really an, oh, my God, we've got to do what we can to tame the deficit. It's a, we don't like big government, and we're going to cut it. Well, and I, th I think it's it's also worth mentioning, and, and fact check me if I'm wrong here, but I think the last time we had consistent balanced budgets and a surplus was actually at the end of the Clinton administration. Yes. So um, this is the continuation of a pattern. And, you know, we all know what happened after the Clinton administration. Uh, George W. Bush came to power and, um, you know. We spent a lot of money on a lot of things, including some unnecessary wars. But, um, but, but you know, I think— But let me, let go me ahead. take— I'll, I will sort of go half pull greenite here, right? Um, I basically became convinced over the course of the late Obama years and the Trump presidency that, you know, sort of having an arbitrary target for how little borrowing you want to do or how big or small you want the deficit to be is a mistake. And you do want, in fact, to look at some combination of economic growth and inflation to determine whether you are borrowing too much, spending too little, and so on. So, you know, I think the Tea Party 
era and the sort of centrist Simpson Bowles commission, we're going to cut spending and raise taxes. <laughs> like, I think I, I defended that stuff in, you know, as a as a columnist for the New York Times in 2011 or so. And I, I think I was wrong. I think at that moment you needed, you know, sort of Republican tax cuts and Democratic <laughs> spending to push the economy back towards full employment because inflation was really low and stayed really low. Um, what's different now and now I'll pivot in a more Lozadan direction, right, is that we do actually have inflation. Inflation to me is sort of the immediate the immediate signal that you are borrowing and spending too much and that you need to pare back. And so once inflation becomes a factor again, then some kind of deficit hawk politics makes sense. Um, I, was it Cheney who had the like, you know, Reagan proved deficits don't matter line? Was that Dick Cheney? Yes, that was um, alleged. That this was a allegedly something that Dick Cheney said about yes, the Bush tax cuts. Yes. And I mean, I completely agree that the debt is not something that you ever need to fully pay back. It's not like one day you want to get to zero. Inbox um, zero. And um, <laughs> <laughs> that, however, is appealing. And so, you know, folks say that if your national income keeps growing, you know, if you're a strong economy, it's OK to carry this big debt. But even as a proportion of our national income, of our of our GDP, the debt keeps rising. It was about a third of GDP for most of the of the early 2000s. But over the past decade, it's risen very quickly. We're close to debt at about 100 percent of our national income, and it's projected to keep going. So if you're going to play that, like we're a superpower and we're strong enough to carry a debt, you need to kind of have the the income growth to back that up. And it's not clear that we that we do. I also think that this is, it's worth remembering that this is the first time in our kind of conscious lifetimes that inflation has been a really big deal, right? Like we've lived through a a sort of interregnum period where inflation just really hasn't been a factor at all. And there has also, of course, been tremendous um, economic growth. But the other thing that feels new and different is we, we basically have no culture of like actual real deal making in Washington anymore. Um, The level of polarization feels so acute and extreme that, um, you know, you can see how you get to these moments where having the debt ceiling and the possibility of default as a, you know, quote unquote hostage that one side can take is the way that you get even relatively modest achievements to whatever your goal is, whether you're, you know, seeking to increase or decrease spending. Well, Lydia, before we get to the question of hostage-taking and compromise, let's take a quick break. So, Ross, I'm interested in what you think of the idea that hostage taking is really the only viable negotiating strategy in this moment. So, on the one hand, I mean, yes, obviously, in a sort of high polarization environment, you end up sort of needing these slightly ridiculous deadlines in in order to sort of actualize compromise. And we saw a lot of this in the Obama years, right? It wasn't just the debt ceiling. It was the government shutdown. And it was the famous uh, fiscal cliff that, oh, you know, we, we all memories. probably probably remember. I mean, the whole Obama, after the Tea Party Congress was elected in 2010, the whole Obama era was basically just a series of desperate deadline negotiations over fiscal matters. I do think things are slightly different under Biden There's a a little bit more of a sense among the relevant parties in the White House and on the Republican side that you're sort of trying to separate external theatrics from internal negotiations, right? And, And this is the idea that has sometimes been called secret Congress. I'm not sure if Matt Iglesias coined that term or someone else, but it's it's basically the idea that in the Tea Party era, you really had a lot of sort of highly ideological figures, Ted Cruz above all, sort of driving the cart in in actual negotiations. And the Obama White House was not particularly good at negotiating with Republicans. In the Biden years, Biden seems to be actually better 
at doing behind the scenes negotiations with Republicans. And Republicans themselves seem to have more appetite for bargaining and compromise. So you have this kind of separation between what people say, which is, you know, the evil socialists are are poised to once again turn America into a Marxist dystopia. And meanwhile, behind the scenes, you're doing an infrastructure bill. There isn't this sense, Obama had this habit of sort of telling Republicans what they should do. And so even if it was something that they should do, <laughs> they were like, well, we're not going to we're not going to do that just because you, Mr. Smarty Pants, have told us the thing. Whereas Biden doesn't seem to do that. Biden just sort of goes in a room and cuts some deals. And that that seems to be a more effective strategy. Yeah, I mean, they call him a grandpa and make fun of the fact that they suggest he can't find his pants or that he's a drooling idiot. But, you know, we are talking about the Inflation Reduction Act and infrastructure reek became a real thing. He got the China competition bill through. He's actually been really productive for a president. Now, whether that continues with McCarthy as the speaker remains to be seen. His right wing is always threatening to blow stuff up, and it has not yet become clear how much power he ceded them when he was desperate to get the gavel. But yes, I think Ross is totally spot on that Obama really graded on Congress and Republicans in particular in a way that Joe Biden, you know, with his avuncular, glad-handing creature of the Senate background, does a much better job at. He actually liked being a senator, unlike uh, Barack Obama, who famously did not like being a senator. Obama didn't like anything. Obama didn't like <laughs> being anything. Aww. At every stage of his career, he was always dissatisfied with the constraints imposed on him by whatever office he held. You know, when he was... A community organizer, you know, it's like it's he didn't have enough sort of influence to do what he wanted to do when he was in the in the state Senate in Illinois. You know, same thing. Senator, same thing. It was it was something that you even see in his presidential memoir. Sorry, this is a huge detour. But like when every time you are dissatisfied with the thing and the place you're in, it, it might be you. OK, but anyway, we'll stop there. <laughs> Joe just seems so damn happy to be wherever he is. You know, um. Biden's ability to kind of be involved and, and run the kind of the backroom dealings is different once this deal is done. And now McCarthy has to sort of sell it to the Republicans in Congress. Right. I think on Monday, Biden was asked, you know, in one of those appearances outside the White House, you know, like, why aren't you out there trumpeting this deal a little more? And he's like, do you think that would help it? Do you think that would help the cause of the deal if I'm out there saying how great I think it is? You know, so even right. even with Biden, he has to kind of know when to pull back. Right. For The Democrats don't want to say it's too good and scare off Republicans. Republicans don't want to say it's too good and scare off Democrats. It's important in these situations that everybody hates it. You have to telegraph that, oh, my God, you know, this is terrible. Everybody needs to hate it at least a little bit. This may be sort of a bleak and, and slightly pessimistic take, but, you know, what seems really clear to me is that if this deal does get through, it's likely that Republicans will pay no price for their intransigence in, in bringing us to the brink of, of disaster. And at the same time, it seems really likely that the Democrats, um, and Joe Biden in particular, will really reap no rewards for their willingness to compromise to avoid default. Because at the end of the day, what did we really get here, right? I mean, this deal involves, and the Times analysis said, we would save uh, approximately $55 billion next year, and over the course of 10 years, $860 billion. Now, to, to us, that sounds like a lot of money, but— To you, Lydia, not, not, not to me. <laughs> not to Ross. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, like considering the size of our obligations, the overall spending in the budget, it's not that it's not that much, right? I mean, I think that's the the cruel irony is that we've been through all of this for 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 a bunch of of you know quote unquote savings that are really very small beer. But but we haven't. I mean, I, I guess the the counter is what have we been through, right? Like those of us paid money, not billions of dollars, but money to follow politics for a living have been through a certain kind of journey. But <laughs> clearly nobody on Wall Street took seriously the idea that we were actually going to default. Nobody in the country seemed to take it that seriously. And again, that may have been folly and this deal might fall apart and maybe we will default. But the default, if you will, among most people has been Republicans are making some kind of small ask 
and Biden's probably going to give them something as a fig leaf to cast this vote. And it's not the ideal way for politics to work, but it is kind of how politics are working lately. And we're just sort of coping with it. And yeah, it's not it's not the big it's certainly not the big transformative bargain. But if Republicans had said we want the big transformative thing, the Biden plan was to hammer them for it. The whole Biden setup was assuming that Republicans were going to go back to like Paul Ryan's budgets and demand big ticket changes to Medicare and Social Security. And the Democrats were were hoping they would do that so they could then say, you are holding, you know, holding the government hostage in order to cut Social Security, you monsters. And if Republicans had done that, their poll numbers would have gone in the toilet and et cetera, et cetera. But, but that's no. not what Republicans did. So no. so nobody freaked out, right? It's it's not it's not what McCarthy did, but it's unclear to me whether I mean, if this bill ends up passing with, you know, essentially the 30 or 40 most right-wing Republicans saying we're not voting for this, and it's the Democrats who make up, you know, sort of centrist um Democrats who make up the difference to get this bill over the line, then you'll have a, you know, the sort of fire-breathing caucus able to go out there and say, like, we didn't vote for this, but it's left to the Democrats to be the grown-ups in the room and to not fall for this hissy fit. And it's it's the Democrats who who have to, in essence, give up on some of their priorities, right? And, you know, what does the Fiscal Responsibility Act do, right? It ends the freeze on student loan payments, increases work requirements for food stamp recipients, you know, these are moments when the Democrats have to trade away some of what some would consider their their values in order to promote the higher value of not crashing the American economy. Well, well, and they lost the last election, right? I mean, so the Democrats controlled the entire government and passed some of the most dramatic spending programs that we've seen in my lifetime. And that helped contribute to the first major inflation that we've seen in my adult lifetime. And yes, now they have to give up some of their priorities because they lost because this is a democracy. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not crying. I mean, again, like the, the debt ceiling may be the bad time to make that kind of deal. But if you lose the popular vote for the House of Representatives and the other party takes over the House of Representatives, then you have to give up some of your priorities. And let's be clear, when they control the entire government, and this is what irritates a lot of progressives, they could have killed the debt ceiling. Um, right. The Times editorial board actually asked them, yes. wouldn't this be a good time to stop this nonsense and kill the debt ceiling? And they had a calculation that, one, the Republicans would hammer them as being profligate spenders if they made that move, and two, that they would always <laughs> Which they be, do anyway, right? They'd always have the political edge on the question of who would get blamed if it came down to this. And right. as so often happens in these situations, that was not a correct calculation, and now here we are. And they are unlikely to get that opportunity again for a while. And so, yeah, there are a lot of people annoyed about that, myself included. I mean, one w one question is, in it is sort of an open question, like, in a scenario where there's a Republican president and a Democratic Congress, which we certainly could have in the near future, could Democrats gain a political advantage by saying, we won't raise the debt ceiling unless you agree to, you know, certain tax increases, right? Like the, the thing we haven't tested under current conditions is Democrats say we won't raise the debt ceiling unless you raise the top tax rate by 2%, which would pull very well. And th that would be an interesting test of Democratic sort of leverage and power in some Yeah, and it's scenario. also a test of just the general disposition of the parties. I mean, the, the uh, attack on Democrats by their own is always that they're not willing to play hardball, that when it comes down to are you willing to crash the economy, they're always going to be like, mm, no, because they worry about good governance and they worry about doing the responsible thing. Now, as you say, if it comes down to that and they could surprise everyone, but traditionally speaking, that is the big rap on them is because they worry about making government function better rather than making government look bad. They're at a disadvantage in these situations. They don't want to blow it all up.
Speaking of blowing it all up, I have a question for you guys. There was a lot of pressure on Biden from the left to uh, either use the 14th Amendment or my personal favorite, uh, mint the trillion dollar platinum coin. Why do you think Biden was so reluctant to lean on either of those? And, and was he right not to? I think there was an assumption that neither of those strategies would necessarily fare well in front of Brett Kavanaugh and John Roberts, who would be sort of the decisive votes, and that the awareness that they probably wouldn't fare well would create turmoil, and Joe Biden is an incumbent president. I mean, it, this is where Joe Biden's interests and the long-term interests of the Democratic Party were not precisely aligned, right? Because, yeah, maybe it's in the long-term interests of the Democratic Party as the party that likes government and likes more of it, <laughs> not to have this extra checkpoint, right, on increased spending. So, you know, in that sense, they have an interest in getting rid of the debt ceiling or sort of proving that you can't, you know, ever hold it hostage. But Biden doesn't have any, any kind of interest in risking economic chaos. It's much better for Biden to give the Republicans, you know, some billions in some kind of minor deal than to sort of do something outre, constitutionally dubious, that maybe does actually spook the markets because he's up for re-election. And I do think we agree that the deal ain't all that, right? It's not like anybody on the Republican side is going to go home cheering, oh my God, we slashed government so dramatically. I mean, I guess Kevin McCarthy will. This does well, very, McCarthy. it does very little to put even a dent in the nation's debt problem. Like driving the debt is stuff like Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security and tax rates. And none of those are on the table. No one. This is a tiny chunk, a tiny, tiny chunk of what is actually driving indebtedness. Because the party that likes to cut things has the older voters. And so the idea that Republicans are going to open themselves up to getting hit as stealing grandma's Social Security check, that's not going to happen anytime soon. It's going to take somebody a lot smoother than, say, Ron DeSantis to sell that. Well, we ran it. We ran that experiment with Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan. And that went very well. That, that just I feel the Romney administration was one of our best. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things that, you know, it's I think it's always been true that whoever is has the White House likes to spend without regard. And it's really only the Republicans who want to sort of clamp down on spending um, when a Democrat is in office. But, you know, does this calculus fundamentally change, given that we're sort of hurtling towards a world in which, you know, both parties really want to keep the taps open on things that, that are considered non-negotiable, right? I mean, as the Republican Party's constituency includes lots and lots and lots of people who are, you know, highly dependent on entitlements and other forms of, of government um, largesse, it, it seems like we're, we're just going to head further and further down this track of more and more debt. I mean, it's like a family trying to control their budget if they take the mortgage and the utilities off the table and they're just trying to balance things with haircuts and how many trips to, you know, the sports bar you make in a certain month. If you're not going to tackle these big things, especially with entitlement spiraling, you're always going to be scrambling and messing around at the edges. It's, it's just the way it is. But it seems like there's just no constituency, right? Is there any political constituency that's going to do what, say, Emmanuel Macron did in France, you know, and say, you know, we're going to have to, you know, raise the, the retirement age, uh, for example? Lydia, I love how you've, you've come around. You've started saying, like, you That's know, that right. that doesn't, doesn't matter. And now by the end of the show, you, you know, <laughs> no, you no, want to no, go no. Full, just... full, full Macron, yeah. I mean, if we take it seriously, I personally don't take it seriously. But if we do, uh, is there is there a, is there a constituency? Is there a political movement that can carry that torch, or is that moment just behind us? So you're not a fiscal hawk, okay? I think not as long as older voters vote at the disproportionate. Uh, numbers that they do. Like, if young people start turning out and making politicians feel the pain when politicians mess with their programs, maybe. But politicians only care about you if you consistently vote, and old people consistently vote. And if you touch their Medicare, you're doomed. So let's leave it there. And when we come back, hot and cold. Thank you. 
And finally, it's time for Hot Cold, where every week one of us shares something we're into, over, or somewhere in between. So who's got the hot cold this week? I have one. This is a show that I think not nearly enough people watched called Somebody Somewhere. It's a 30-minute uh, dramedy that stars uh, a woman named Bridget Everett. She's, you know, six feet tall, built like a linebacker, and has the voice of an angel. She's a beautiful singer. Um, the show is this sort of lightly autobiographical show where she plays a version of herself who never became a kind of famous performer. And... Um, this show is just an incredibly, I want to call it warm-hearted, but that sounds a little too cheeseball. But there's something sort of deeply earnest, kind, and um, and welcoming about the story. Um, not a whole lot happens on the show, but in some ways, that's the beauty of it. It's a it's a show that's that that's really about friendship. It's about home. It's about the things that sustain us. And the older I get, the more I realize that friendship is is possibly the most important cohesive force in my life. So now that everybody's wrapped up the black heart of succession, I just want to recommend that they uh, go back and watch uh, the two seasons of Somebody Somewhere. It is a real treat. I'm a huge fan of cheese ball, so I'm all for this. <laughs> I'm writing down Somebody Somewhere. Okay. Well, we'll leave it at that then. Talk to you guys next week. When the national debt will hit <laughs> no. an even higher figure. Go to the debt clock. It's freaky. Thanks for joining our conversation. If you liked it, be sure to follow Matter of Opinion on your favorite podcast app. And if you want to tell us what big questions you think we ought to talk about next, send us an email at matteropinion at nytimes.com. Matter of Opinion was produced by Sofia Alvarez-Boyd, Phoebe Lett, and Derek Arthur. Edited by Stephanie Joyce. Our fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Isaac Jones, Carol Sabaro, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Carol Sabaro. Audience strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samuluski. Special thanks to Allison Benedict. And our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. <laughs>